The citizens of the Slot Empire are at a loss for words with what they just witnessed. No, it can't be. They refuse to believe that the disgusting, filthy pig of a man before them is the legendary hero they've been waiting for. Yeah, no hi, hello. Just hating straight from the gate. For courtesy's sake, let's go get some context from the previous day. This is Hensem Chaud, the manager of the Facking 100 Yen store. As you can see, Hensem is, well, so handsome that he has their female customers adding some cream to their paninis at his mere gaze. But while his face is that of an angel, his attitude toward our MC, Aburatani Kantaro, is that of a devil. Anyway, Kantaro mans one of the registers, just as he was told, but for whatever reason, no customer wants to queue on his line. This persists even when Nishiki Ren, another store staff, arrives and replaces Hensem on the register. It's almost as if the customers are avoiding him like a plague. This doesn't bother him, though, because as long as sweet Ren is around to smile at him, he's fine with anything. That night, Ren talks to Hensem and complains about Kantaro. He leers at her all the time, which makes her feel all icky and uncomfortable. She just can't stand it anymore. This is basically that, hello, human resources, Mimi. Eager to please his cute subordinate, Hensem assures her that he'll do something about Kantaro and his sticky eyes. After all, he's the only one who can feast on Ren's beauty. From there, the two share a steamy lip action and we all know what happens after that. Unbeknownst to them, Kantaro is eavesdropping on their conversation. He can't believe that sweet Ren is Hensem's plaything. Moreover, he can't believe she was so disgusted by him that she asked their manager to fire him. If this is how she really feels, then why does she act all nice and kind to him all the time? You really can't trust anyone these days. Heartbroken, Kantaro heads home with tears in his eyes. This is his fault. He knows it's a mistake to get his hopes up just because Ren was a little nice to him, but the mere thought of her having relations with another man crushes his soul. There's no way he can stand for that. Not for another 10 years, at least. Oh, wow. Bro thinks he's Aaron Yeager. Anyway, Kantaro knows there's nothing he can do, so he decides to purge his emotions by charming his cobra with Ren in mind. After this catharsis, he swears not to think about her again. But even after the rattling of the snake, he still isn't satisfied. Damn it. How many times must he bid his beloved goodbye? Set on forgetting Ren, Kantaro goes harder, faster, and stronger. He does it so fast that he, uh, literally dies after expelling the snake's venom. The next day, his low-tier otaku friend, Mitsui Yuria, walks into his house, calling him Admiral. But to his surprise, he's greeted by his Admiral's lifeless body. When Kantaro regains consciousness, he finds himself buck bear in a field. The last thing he remembers is dying in the dumbest way possible, so he's confused about how he even got here. Just then, a beautiful woman who introduces herself as Mira Crudes approaches him. With a gentle smile, she reveals herself as the goddess who oversees the jacking and jilling of all humanity. As a reward for Kantaro's perfect attendance and for holding the record for having the most DIY activities since the death of Satan, she grants him a blessing as the chosen hero. She says that by blurbing himself regularly, he will be able to raise his level and save humanity. Then, before disappearing, Mira tells our boy to defeat the accursed demons with his heroic powers and grant salvation to the world. The next thing Kantaro knows, he's alone in the field aside from the chest that magically appeared beside him. This is when he realizes that he has just been isekai'd as a hero. Inspecting his body, he notices that his appearance is the same, so he deduces that he got transported, not reincarnated. But why is he unclothed? The residents of this world will absolutely not accept him if they see him like this. So if he wants to save the world, he needs to find some clothing first. With that, he checks the contents of the chest, hoping to see some garments. But much to his surprise, he sees a smaller chest inside. He opens it carefully, and inside, he finds a string and a leaf to cover his privates. Kantaro tries them on, and just as he expected, he feels more embarrassed wearing this ridiculous outfit than being bare. And if that isn't enough, his perversion also increased by 120. How the hell is this a hero's gear? Why? Why must he be the lowest of the low, even in another world? All of a sudden, a wolf appears before Kantaro. He screams his lungs out, thinking he's dead meat. However, when the beast lifts its head, he discovers that it's actually a girl. Then, for some reason, she gives him a hecking snifferino. His words, not ours. As she does, Kantaro readies himself for her adverse reaction. But if you think he'll get hurt by this, you're wrong because this boy is into degradation. Yes, that's right. He's a sweaty, freaky gentleman. Scorn him, call him disgusting and whatever. He digs that kind of stuff. Upon recognizing that he has the scent of a hero, the wolf girl Michiru hugs him and pushes him down. She wants to do nice things with him. 
This, of course, sets Kantaro's clock from 6 to 12. Unfortunately, before any action can happen, a group of knights led by a woman named Sadis T. Quinn shoes Michiru away. She's the Slath Empire's defense force captain. Oi, low-class demon, scram or we'll slay you, she orders Michiru. Quinn then looks at Kantaro the same way one would look at a cockroach and studies him. She thought they were here to save a human, not a pig. Human hag, me hate so much, the demon girl says. Noticing Michiru's agitated stance, Quinn orders her men to prepare for slaughter. If this low-class demon wants to fight, then they'll give her one. With that, she unleashes an aura so intense that Mishiru yields. She promises to play with our boy next time before skedaddling away. With Wolf Girl gone, Quinn stares daggers at Kentaro and asks him what he was thinking. Did he want to die that badly? She exasperatedly says it's common sense that demons violate humans to suck their life force dry. But that aside, she questions his unsightly appearance. Nervous, Kentaro reveals that he's the hero destined to save humanity. You'd think that this would make things easier for him, but no. Quinn is so angry by what he said that she orders her knights to restrain and capture him. How dare he claim to be the hero? Though Kantaro insists he isn't lying and that he's here to save the world, no one listens to his plea. With his hands tied like a criminal, our boy is taken to Vingerink, the Empire's capital city. Everyone's either staring him down or mocking him. Not a single soul here thinks he's the hero. But not believing his claims and treating him this badly are two very different things. Kantaro doesn't understand why he's being publicly shamed. It's not as if he's a criminal or something. Besides, he really is the hero. The goddess told him so. Annoyed, Quinn tells him that he is, in fact, a criminal, and his crime is claiming to be the hero when all he is is a disgustingly ugly and filthy guy. Because of this, he committed a grave sin of heresy. Man, they're really criminalizing him because they think he's ugly. This kingdom needs more than just saving. She then elbows him in the face and asks about the goddess he's talking about. Without missing a beat, Kantaro explains that the goddess Mira, the one who oversees the jacking and jilling of all humanity, is the one who had told him that he's a hero. Okay, he didn't try to even sound believable at all. An irate Quinn shoves her boot against Kantaro's face and orders him to shut his trap. No one's going to believe a filthy pig like him anyway. Fortunately, the goddess the Empire believes in is benevolent, so even a pig like him will be given a chance to prove his innocence. Quinn then leads Kantaro to the Dikadali Fountain, where he will be judged fairly in front of the citizens. She points to the legendary sword and explains that the hero once used it to slay accursed demons. Only the Chosen One will be able to pull it from the ground, so if Kantaro really is who he claims to be, he'll be able to pull it without problems. However, failing to do so means he will be executed on the spot. Knowing the possible consequence of his following action, Kantaro stands before the sword, holds its hilt, and hesitantly moves to pull it. But before he can do so, the captain stops him out of nowhere. Why? Because even though Kantaro didn't notice it, Quinn saw the sword move ever so slightly as he pulled it. Astonishment takes hold of her as she realizes that the hero they've been waiting for is really this filthy man-pig. The guy is so ugly that not even his mom would lie to him about it. The hero is supposed to be shining, brilliant, and elegant. A charismatic man who's loved by all, not whatever the heck this guy is. Jesus H. Christ, guys. Chill. Having a kingdom that needs outside intervention is an even bigger L. In any case, Quinn thinks of a way to prevent him from being hailed as the hero. Desperate times call for desperate measures, so she pours massage oil all over the sword, lying that it's a sacred oil that amplifies the blade's affinity with the hero. Without an ounce of guilt, she says, if you really are the hero, then this would make things easier for you. Eager to please Quinn, Kantaro grabs the hilt of the sword and pulls it, but his hands expectedly slip off it because of the oil. He tries to do it over and over again. However, the result remains the same. Now annoyed at his stubbornness, the crowd stones him and tells him to give up already. He manages to dodge some of them, but eventually gets hit in the gut, causing him to fall on his knees. Still, Kantaro refuses to give up. He still has one thing left to do, and that is to marry a girl who will acknowledge him as a hero. Set on succeeding this time, he puts every ounce of strength he has in his hands and pulls the sword, but he accidentally slips and bumps into Quinn, causing the jar of oil to land on her head. Kantaro offers his hand to help her, but the two of them slip because of the oil and land upside down like a dead cockroach. If that isn't embarrassing enough, the captain also slips out of her clothes. Needless to say, Quinn is mortified. No, she is seething with rage. 
As soon as she regains composure, she announces the trial to be over and orders her men to execute the Fatso, who embarrassed her in front of the citizens. Keen on keeping his head, Kantaro desperately explains that what happened was an accident, yet his pleas fall on deaf ears. He must pull the sword. That's the way. He grabs its hilt once more, but before he can pull it out, Quinn trips again, and this time, her hand lands on our boy's blade. With that, our boy expels some jelly babies all over the town square. And so, in the year 202 of the Cummin era, the citizens of the Empire of Slot witnessed three great events. One, the man chowder shower, two, the pulling of the legendary sword, and three, the arrival of the long-awaited hero. Unbeknownst to Kantaro, some of the baby gravy landed on the arm of a city boy named Mago. His grandpa panics and desperately pleads for someone to help his poor boy. Thankfully, a warrior named Kakate Hoshiina approaches the boy and wipes it off for him. Feeling bad, the grandfather profusely apologizes and thanks her for doing such a dirty job on their behalf. But just then, Mago notices that the injury on his arm has healed all of a sudden. His grandfather spilled brown tea on him, yet the burn is now completely healed. But how? This is when Shiina realizes what transpired. The boy's burn healed thanks to the liquid released from the hero's gun. If her assumption is correct, then maybe her left eye still has a chance to be mended. You see, Sheena has always been bullied because of her impaired eye. She wasn't just teased, she was treated as an outcast. The kids in town avoided her as if she were a witch. This all started when she was attacked by a magic user. Though her mother tried to protect her, Sheena still got hit, which cost her her left eye. From then on, her mom kept tormenting herself for failing to shield her daughter from the attack. On the other hand, Sheena blamed herself for making her mother despair. She's willing to do anything if her left eye can be healed with the help of the hero. Meanwhile, Quinn unwillingly leads Kantaro to the fornication castle so he can have an audience with the king. But since he isn't exactly presentable, she takes him to a clothing store to replace the indecent garment he's wearing, if you can even call it a garment. The attendant gives Kantaro some clothes to try on. However, everything he puts on magically gets repelled from his body. This obviously pisses Quinn off. Does this mean Kantaro will have to meet the king while looking like a link sausage? To cool her down, the attendant suggests that she try on some clothes, to which she agrees. Quinn ultimately dons a tank top and a skirt, but what she doesn't know is that she chose children's clothes, meaning they're all too small for her. Seeing her thingamajings, Kantaro's clock swiftly went from six to 12. This, of course, infuriates Quinn, so she kicks him out and orders him to do something about his watchtower, or else she'll chop it off. There's no way he can meet the king like this. Kantaro can only do one thing at times like this, so he heads to the toilet. But much to his surprise, he finds Sheena inside waiting for him. Before he can even say anything, though, she tells him to shush so Quinn won't know that she's there. Without further ado, she reveals that her reason for being here is the hero's essence. To be specific, she wants a face mask. The more Kantaro thinks about it, the more he feels like he's in a fever dream. He can't believe such a serious-looking girl would make such a request. Not that he's complaining, though. So from there, Sheena wields the hero's sword, but alas, it isn't glowing. An embarrassed Kantaro explains that the flower isn't blooming because it's looking for a providence called degradation. She can opt not to tell him the reason for this odd request, but for now, he wants her to insult him as much as she can. This takes Sheena aback. Her mother once warned her that hurting someone always comes in a full circle. However, she also reminded her that becoming a big person in the future would inadvertently lead her to hurt others, so she must be prepared to get hurt in return. With this in mind, Sheena wonders if this situation is similar to what her mother told her. Does this mean that Kantaro wants her to insult him so that he can hurt her back? Did he just see through her dignity? Her train of thought is then interrupted when he tells her not to hesitate. He smiles and admits that he wants to be insulted by a beautiful woman like her. Without any further delay, Sheena attacks Kantaro with a barrage of insults. She talks crap about his face, size, and even the polluted air he exhales until finally the Excalibur shines with its holy glow and releases its essence. With the deed done, she warns him not to let anyone know about what happened, or else she'll cut his lousy pork meat and flush it down the toilet. From there, Sheena washes her face, and true enough, her left eye is now fully healed, thanks to Kantaro. The hero heads back to a very pissed off Quinn, who immediately starts insulting him. While listening to her, he wonders why he suddenly feels hurt by the painful words she's throwing at him. This is normal to him, so he doesn't understand why it's making his heartache. Could it possibly be because of the clarity he had in the toilet? Meanwhile, Mishiru reunites with her friends Raz Call and Red Fox in the forest. Just like her, they're furries too. 
They're hugging each other when Mishiru suddenly notices some white stuff on her belly. Remembering that it's the heroes, she excitedly licks it. Then, the next thing she knows, her body has transformed. If that isn't enough, her magic power has also increased. Oh boy, they all want to have their own taste of that honey. Soon after that, Quinn introduces Kantaro to the rulers of the Empire. The nuns and knights stare daggers at him, but our boy pays them no mind. With his head bowed down, he declares himself to be the chosen hero who will save the world. Before getting to business, Queen Soaked asks Kantaro if he really has met a demon in the forest earlier. Then, upon his confirmation, she tells him of his duty to eradicate the accursed demons of this world. Those vile creatures have been targeting males for far too long, to the point where 50% of the men in the world have already been killed. This is a big news for Kantaro. While he knows that he's the hero destined to save humanity, he didn't expect that he'll have to slay any demons, or anything, for that matter. Exasperated over Kantaro's slowness, King Stuck exclaims that it's necessary for him to exterminate the demons because of their evil deeds against mankind. If he doesn't, they will suck the life force of all men until they become extinct. As such, it's Kantaro's duty to prevent this from happening. Only the legendary hero can annihilate the demon tribe after all. Having said that, the Empire won't be able to do anything if Kantaro can't do that. He's worthless and ugly, so they aren't expecting much from him anyway. Not wanting to be insulted further, Kantaro reluctantly agrees to kill what should be killed. To this, Queen Soaked says, I'm counting on you, brave pig. Damn, why is this empire filled with such foul-mouthed people? With that settled, the queen asks Quinn to accompany the hero on his journey to annihilate the demon race. She also orders a priestess named Caress to tag along on the journey. Yes, these are their names. No, we did not make them up. Just like Quinn, Priestess Caress is also an incredibly beautiful and blessed woman. But unlike Quinn, she has a gentle aura that makes even the knights fall for her. Quite frankly, Kantaro can't believe that he's going on a trip with such gorgeous ladies. Talk about jackpot! Following that, Priestess Caress climbs the stairs to stand beside Kantaro and Quinn, but she suddenly trips and loses her glasses. Kantaro swiftly picks it up and gives it to her. However, before he can do so, he sees the holy hills peeking from her robes, earning a salute from the admiral. Seeing the sword, Quinn panics and orders him not to face the king and queen while his snake is agitated. She tells him to put it away, but where the heck is he supposed to put it? All he has is this stupid leaf and it really isn't covering anything. Thankfully, Priestess Caress cannot see anything while this is all happening. The girl is practically blind without her glasses, so she's unaware of the agitated cobra in front of her. She prepares herself to stand up, but as she does, her top gets stuck on Kantaro's tralala, which ultimately reveals her bountiful bounties. Right now, Kantaro is having the toughest internal battle of his life. He can't. He mustn't. He's a brave man, and he can endure this. But does he really have to? Didn't these people insult him? In the end, our boy lets the jelly go on the poor nun. Needless to say, Priestess Caress passes out the moment she puts on her glasses. As for Quinn, what happened just now further proves that the filthy man-pig before her isn't fit to be the savior of humanity. After his audience with the king and queen, Kantaro is now officially recognized as the hero. Accompanied by the gentle priestess Caress and fearsome Captain Quinn, he now has to prepare for his journey to the den of the demons. While walking along the corridor of the castle, Kantaro talks to priestess Caress and apologizes for what happened earlier. They started off on the wrong foot, so now he wants to properly introduce himself. He's in the middle of greeting the priestess when, all of a sudden, something hard hits him on the neck, rendering him unconscious. When Kantaro opens his eyes, he finds himself in one of the cells in the castle's dungeon. Confused, he looks around only to see Quinn sitting on the bench beside him. What in the world is going on, and why the heck does he keep getting treated like a criminal? The captain gives him a no-nonsense look and asks why he hasn't declared that he will exterminate the demon race as the hero. What he told the queen was he would kill what should be killed, but that's not the same as annihilating the demons as a whole. Is he perhaps having second thoughts about killing them? Rendering demons weak and powerless isn't enough. There should be no room for mercy when it comes to dealing with them. Up until now, the number of men who have been killed and women who have mourned their deaths is inestimable. If they let those blasted beasts go, the Empire will surely suffer severe repercussions. This issue isn't a matter of the hero's discretion, so Quinn suggests that Kantaro quit as a hero if he can't do it. Astonished, Kantaro exclaims that quitting isn't an option for him because he has already been recognized by the king and queen. The people in the town square also saw him pull the sword, so he can't go back on his word. Without skipping a beat, Quinn reveals that the solution to Kantaro's dilemma is simple. They can tell the citizens that he used illusion magic. That way, 
It will be as if the hero never appeared. Sure, he might get stoned and burned at the stake, but he isn't needed in the first place anyway. What good is a hero who can't perform his duties objectively? Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't think Quinn here has any right to be talking about objectivity. In any case, if he doesn't want to die, then the only option he has is to exterminate the demons, just as they discussed in the throne room. Until he accepts that, Quinn refuses to recognize him as a hero. Despite everything the captain told him, Kantaro remains torn. Michiru, the cute wolf girl he met earlier, promised him that they'd play next time. She's the only one who has been somewhat nice to him since he got here. Is he really supposed to kill her? Seeing that Kantaro still hasn't made up his mind pisses Quinn to no end, so if she can't make him understand the gravity of the situation using her words, she will resort to using force. With that, the captain kicks Kantaro on the leg, making him fall on his back. She then sits on him, but for whatever reason, he seems to be enjoying the pain. Next, she grabs and hits him, yet his reaction is still the same. Our boy is loving every second of this so-called punishment. The knight guarding the cell quickly picks up on this, but Quinn remains oblivious that what she's inflicting isn't pain, but pleasure. More annoyed than ever, she ties him up and whips him, demanding that he makes his decision already. While all this is happening, Kantaro suddenly finds himself remembering something that happened when he was 15. During his last Valentine's Day in middle school, he saw Haramachi give Yuichiro, their class representative, a box of chocolates. Kantaro didn't stay to see what happened next, though, but he assumed that Yuichiro accepted her gift. Still, Haramachi was the type of girl who kept things to herself and never stood out, so it surprised him to know that she had that kind of initiative. As he walked back to class, Kantaro suddenly noticed the same box of chocolates he saw earlier in the trash. He swiftly picked it up and confronted Yuichiro about it. As someone who hasn't received obligatory chocolates before, it pained Kantaro to know that this perfectly fine gift was rejected. Not accepting someone's present is intolerable after all. Unmoved, Yuichiro explained that he did not accept the chocolates from Haramachi because she probably got them from someone and wanted to throw them away. After all, there was a rumor going around that Haramichi slept around with everyone. This was the first time Kantaro had heard about this. Nevertheless, he pleaded, saying that even if the rumor was correct, Haramachi must really have feelings for Yuichiro since she chose him out of everyone. Wasn't that enough reason for him to accept her gift? With his back turned, Yuichiro firmly said that he couldn't accept the chocolates. Harsh as it may be, he wasn't keen on carrying Haramachi's load. From there, Kantaro proceeded to meet with Haramachi. With the chocolates in his hands, he told her that Yuichiro didn't accept his gift, not because of the rumors about her, but because he didn't have the confidence to take on the burden of her life. Kantaro told her not to throw the chocolates away and wished that she didn't fall into despair. Despite the reputation Haramachi had, he assured her that she wasn't dirty and that her feelings were sincere, pure, and beautiful. In a sudden turn of events, he got down on his knees and asked that she give him even half of the love she has for Yuichiro, since he didn't accept it anyway. Alas, Haramachi declined his feelings. Back in the present, Kantaro finds it in him to talk back against Quinn. He has been looked down on, insulted, and berated since coming to this world. Yet Michiru, a demon, was the only one who didn't do that to him. She was the only one who showed him some form of love, and because of that, he swears to date and form an intimate relationship with her. No, scratch that. He will marry her no matter what happens. Unfortunately, this doesn't move Quinn at all. While tickling him with her whip, she asks what kind of woman would be in the right mind to marry an ugly pig like him. Seeing that Kantaro is still having fun while getting tickled, she switches to hitting him, saying, the fun ends here. What does she have to do to make him suffer? Just then, one of the knights arrives and declares that the queen is looking for her. As soon as Quinn arrives, Queen Soaked gets straight to business. She knows that the Defense Force captain and the hero aren't getting along well. That said, things will get complicated if they continue like this. The world will succumb to the temptation of the demon race, and Kantaro, that foolish hero, will be the end of it all. So, to prevent that from happening, she thought of a plan, and today, they will practice together. Queen Soaked then instructs the captain to take off all her clothes and sit on the chair. Next, she pours oil all over her form and says that today, she will learn how to please a man. Kantaro has always been looked down on for his looks. He smoke nothing, his swag too mid, his hoe non-existent. Everyone wants to kill him. That doesn't change, even when he arrived to this other world. It's truly unfortunate that he's continually judged merely for his arrangement of bones, fat, and muscle, all to the point of being dismissed and resented. Still, the sword doesn't lie. God knows Kantaro's doesn't. Though he has a lot to prove, he's willing to take one step at a time. 
Besides, with how stacked his healing ability is, the kingdom will likely come to learn that they need him more than he needs them. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.